we're going to look at analyzing graphs of polynomial functions. First, we're going to review some vocabulary that we've had. Remember that a zero is the x value or values where f of x is equal to zero, and it can be real or it can be imaginary. A factor is any quantity x minus h equals zero where h is one of your zeros of your polynomial. The solution is another name for a zero and your x-intercepts, those are the points where the graph crosses the x-axis. They are the real zeros or solutions of your function. And we're going to just quick review how to graph. Remember the first thing you need to do is find and plot any real zeros that you have and you can use any of the factoring techniques that we've learned. You then do a table of values and remember that you need to pick points on all sides of all your zeros. Then you're going to plot those points. You're going to determine what the end behavior of your function is. And then you're going to sketch the graph and then make sure that your end behavior of your graph matches what you determine the end behavior to be. Here's our first practice problem. We need to graph 0.25 times the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 1, that quantity squared. First thing we need to do is identify what is our degree. Now this one doesn't come out and just tell you the degree because it's in factored form, but if you think about x plus 2 times x minus 1 times x minus 1, I have three x's here that are going to be multiplied together, which would give me an x cubed, so my degree is going to be 3. So that tells me that I'm going to need three zeros. Now that I know I'm going to have three zeros, I need to go about finding them. Now don't make a problem like this harder than it is. This is already factored for you. It's already set into those sets of parentheses. So I need to put my zero in here because I'm interested in when is my polynomial equal to zero. And now I can use that fundamental theorem of algebra that says either x plus 2 has to be equal to zero or x minus 1 has to be equal to zero or x minus 1 has to be equal to zero. Now the reason I wrote the x minus 1 twice is because it's squared, so that means it happened twice. Well, when I solve my first one, I get a 0 of negative 2. My second one, I get a 0 of 1. And my third one, I get a 0 of 1. Now remember, when you get a double 0 like this, that means your graph is just going to come down or up, and it's just going to touch that and then bounce back around. So when I go over here to set up my graph, I've got my three zeros already found. I've got my zeros plotted. Now I need to go ahead and do my table of values to find the rest of my graph. Now remember I need to put or pick points that are on all sides of all my zeros so I need to pick some points to the left of the negative 2. I need to pick some points to the right of the negative 2 and then I also need to pick some points to the right of 1. Well for the left of negative 2 I'm going to pick negative 3 um, for the points in between these, I'm going to go ahead and pick negative 1 and 0. And then for the points to the right of 1, I'm going to just go with a 2. Well, when I plug negative 3 back into my original equation, I get negative 4. When I plug negative 1 into my original equation, I'm going to get a 1. When I plug 0 in, I end up with 1 half. And when I plug positive 2 in, I get 1. So now I'm going to go over here and plot those points. All right. And now I'm going to, before I sketch that in, I'm going to determine my end behavior. Now remember, we've got a positive A out here and an X cubed. So my leading coefficient in my leading degree is 0.25 x cubed. So you've got to ask yourself, when I put a positive infinity here and I cube it, it's going to stay positive, and then when I multiply it by a positive, it's going to stay positive. When I put a negative in here, well a negative cubed is still negative, multiply that negative by a positive, it's going to stay negative. I want to see if that matches. So as I go over here to positive infinity, is my graph going up? And it looks like it's going to. 
And as I go to the left, is my graph going down towards negative infinity? And it looks like it's gonna. So now that I know my end behavior matches, I am going to sketch my graph in there and put my arrows on the end. Now looking at this, this has the shape of a cubic. It's got that squiggle to it, which matches what my degree is. Next thing we're going to look at is turning points. Now a turning point is when you change directions. So right here, I would be going up on my graph, and when I get to this point right about here, I turn and I go down. Well, and then when I get here, I turn again and I start to go up. So this graph has two turning points. Keep that in mind. We're going to be using that later. Okay, here's our second one. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can get this one graphed. Make sure you find the zeros, do your table of values, and check your end behavior. On this one, I started out by identifying that my degree was 2, so I knew I had to have two zeros. Since it's of degree 2, I know it's going to be a parabola, so I can use any of my quadratic um, items. I went ahead and I unfoiled it and found my zeros to be negative 2.5 and, and a positive 2. Then, since it was quadratic, I also decided that I had better find my vertex. And if you remember from previous chapters, our vertex is the opposite of b over 2a. So when I did that, I found my vertex, my x value to be negative 1 fourth, plugged that back in and got negative 10 and 1 eighth. Then I went over and I did my table of values. I picked points on all sides of both of my um, zeros. I also picked a couple extra points. Then I plotted those points did my end behavior, checked to make sure that my end behavior matched, and they both do. So this is what my graph ends up looking like. Again, how many turning points do we have on this one? Well, the only turning point I have is right down here. So this one has one turning point. Okay, here is a third one. See if you can get this one graph. So go ahead and pause the video and see what you come up with. Okay, on this one, I went ahead and I grouped it first, found out that I had a zero at two, and then I had a zero at an imaginary zero. So those don't get graphed because I'm graphing on a real plane. So those imaginary zeros we don't put on our x-axis anywhere because they don't exist on the real axis. We would have to do an imaginary graph for that. I went ahead and I did my table of values. I did a couple extra points in here because as I was doing my table of values and I plotted them, I didn't necessarily like how it looked, so I did a couple extra points in there. Plotted all my points, did my end behavior. Notice that my end behavior matched my graph as I sketched it in there. And it's not a very smooth sketch, but hopefully yours looks a little better. And then I have my graph there. All right, now here's a couple of graphs for my graphing calculator. And notice, this one is of degree 3, and I have two turning points. This other one, degree 4, and I have one, two, three turning points. Now, there's a couple of names that we give to these. This one, since it's rounding out as a peak, it's called a local maximum. And the reason it's called local is because it's only within this range that it's a maximum, because obviously these values over here are all bigger than that one, so it's called a local maximum. This one down here, since it's rounding out as a trough, it's called the local minimum. And again, it's a local because only in this area is it the minimum. These values over here are obviously lower than that one. On this one, we actually have two local minimums and one local maximum. Here's a third graph. This one, well, if I multiplied this out, an x squared times an x squared would give me an x to the fourth. So this is a fourth degree. And notice I only have one turning point. I only have a local minimum. What happens is that a polynomial of degree n has at most n minus one turning points. So that first one we did, was of degree 3, and it had two turning points. That's the maximum number of turning points it could have. The second one we looked at was a fourth degree, and it had three turning points. 
Now this last one is also a fourth degree, but it only has one turning point. Notice here it says that it would have at most n minus 1. So at most it's going to have one less than it's a degree. And if you have the same number of real zeros as your degree, then you're going to have exactly n minus 1. So these first two, their real zeros, or their zeros were all real zeros. So the, the third degree polynomial had three real zeros. The first fourth degree polynomial had four real zeros. This last fourth degree polynomial only has two real zeros, one and two. The other two are imaginary, and that's why the turning points are going to be less. Okay, here's your turn. Go ahead and see if you can get the following equation graphed.